May 8th, 1945, VE Day. Over 22 million have been killed on the battlefields of World War II. Although the Nazi party has been defeated on the European front, the Japanese on the Asian front still pose a threat to the collective strength of the Allies, and to the United States in particular. In a blast of human ingenuity, an explosion of scientific thought, that all changed. July 16th, 1945. Codenamed Trinity, this test of the first atomic bomb forever reinvented warfare, heralding a new age of international relations and global power structures. August 6, 1945. Trinity's success is quickly followed in August by Harry Truman's order to drop the atomic bomb over Hiroshima. Approximately 64,000 people die on this day. August 9, 1945. The U.S. drops a second bomb on Nagasaki. 35,000 more died. August 15, 1945. Japan announces its unconditional surrender. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. Suddenly, the world became defined by a weapon of immense power and terrifying implications, a weapon that could end a war as easily as it could trigger one. The dynamics of the world changed at this point. Man was able to harness it huge amount of energy and make it do what he wanted it to do. In the years following these first flashes of nuclear weapons, the international arena was gripped by the idea of a nuclear bomb, and with it, the guarantee of security, prestige, and power. The Soviet Union successfully detonated its first fission bomb in 1949, effectively ending the American monopoly on nuclear technology and initiating a nuclear arms race that would dominate global politics for the next 40 years. The standoff between these two superpowers, known as the Cold War, intensified over the years. The model of Western ideals, represented by the United States, stood in bitter opposition to the communism of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was scared to death of the United States. That, uh, it had an ideology. The United States had a different ideology, freedom and capitalism, which were anathema to the Soviet Union. At one point, the combined nuclear arsenal of the U.S. and the Soviet Union totaled over 50,000 warheads, enough to destroy the world dozens of times over. Well, in the Cold War, uh, the risk really was an all-out destruction. So, although people talked about limited nuclear war, there was no understanding of how to limit nuclear war. Uh, many millions, tens of millions of people, uh, hundreds of millions of people would have died in the United States, in the uh, Soviet Union, and in the rest of the world. With such overwhelming tension, fear of a nuclear strike dominated the day-to-day -day lives of the American people. The Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 heightened the fear that a nuclear Armageddon was possible. And during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and in other moments, but especially during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when John Kennedy was president, uh, we really came to the very, very edge of the cliff. Uh, a few misstatements, literally at that point, could have pushed us over the break and we could have been in a lot of nuclear confrontation with the Soviets, which in essence would have ended life on the planet as we know it. 
As nuclear know-how spread to countries like the United Kingdom, France, and China, it became vital that the proliferation of these terrifying weapons be checked. March 5th, 1970. The international community attempts to address the spread of nuclear weapons by signing the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. The initial draft of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1968 was done by the U.S. and the Soviet Union. It was brought to the conference, uh, to the uh, 18 Nation Disarmament Committee in Geneva for negotiations. 189 states ultimately became members, recognizing only five nuclear weapon states, the U.S., Russia, China, France, and the U.K. The remaining non-nuclear weapon states agreed not to ever receive, manufacture, or acquire nuclear weapons. This idea of disarmament is not some kind of uh, whimsical utopian dream. First, it is a legal requirement under the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, Article 6, and under the U.S. Constitution, uh, treaties are supreme law of the land. The treaty also provided a future for the peaceful use of nuclear technologies. Under Article 4, nuclear weapon states are obligated to assist others with the transfer of technology and materials to aid peaceful nuclear energy programs. Under the terms of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, states have an inalienable right, an inalienable right to peaceful uses of nuclear energy. But though the treaty guarantees this inalienable right to all signatories, it prohibits the diversion of energy materials to nuclear weapons development. Scientists knew that the same technology that could unlock the century's most powerful weapon could also provide a form of nearly carbon-neutral energy. People in our country are rightly concerned about greenhouse gases and, 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 and the environment, and I can understand why. I am too. As a matter of fact, I try to tell people, let's quit the debate about whether greenhouse gases are caused by mankind or by natural causes. Let's just focus on technologies that deal with the issue. Nuclear power will help us deal with the issue of greenhouse gases. The same chain reaction that caused the destruction of two Japanese cities could also be tamed to provide the energy for dozens more. Finally, I want to talk about nuclear power subject you all are very familiar with. It is uh, a really important way to meet our goals, which is to have abundant, affordable, clean, and safe sources of energy. In the quest for illicit nuclear weapons, a country can mask a uranium or plutonium enrichment program using a facade of developing nuclear energy. There are certain countries that um, they believe are um, making nuclear weapons that are not deteriorated. Iran, for example, is an NPT signatory, yet many suspected of developing nuclear weapons. Uh, and I think we need to be concerned. We need to be concerned about the stockpile of nuclear weapons in Pakistan, in North Korea, uh, in Iran, which is rushing as fast as they can to develop a nuclear stockpile. All of these countries are not friends of the United States, ultimately. None of this is stable. And the more countries of that nature, to have nuclear weapons and both of the weapons, the more where we need to be. Well, okay, so I'll say a country that I can just tell you the CIA just declares as fair to us that they say is making weapons, that they know has, has a weapons program that does with terrorists is Israel. Uh, so I, I'm not, I don't have any political opinions on this or anything, but that's less of a threat than some country that sudden, that a few years ago, you know, wasn't in this business and suddenly is in the business now. Over 30 countries currently operate nuclear energy programs, and 60 more are requesting assistance to develop one from the International Atomic Energy Agency. Nuclear technology is no longer limited to two superpowers. more and more countries get these weapons, there's an increasing probability of, of accidents, miscalculations, or possible use.
December 25th, 1991. Mikhail Gorbachev resigns as the president of the USSR, effectively dissolving the Soviet Union and ending the bipolar rivalry of the Cold War. Well, a lot of people thought that once the Soviet Union dissolved um, and a direct confrontational relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States disappeared in essence in terms of the way it used to be versus what it is now, and that happened very suddenly, uh, there was a kind of a global sigh of relief that our worries about nuclear attacks and nuclear annihilation were gone. Gone were the bomb drills, the fearful anti-communist rhetoric, the apocalyptic forecasts. The threat of a Soviet superpower had disappeared, leaving a power vacuum that many states rushed to fill. During the Cold War, yes, the United States had as many as 35,000 nuclear weapons. The Soviets had 45,000 nuclear weapons at their peak. And uh, that was the concern. It was almost inconceivable anybody else would use nuclear weapons because either the United States or the Soviet Union would have destroyed them totally. Today, the world nuclear stockpile is certainly smaller than during the Cold War. So if you look at a chart showing the, the what, what's happened to the world stockpile of nuclear weapons, it spikes up rather rapidly to about mid-1980 and then it's been dropping off ever since. And right now it's about 20 and, and the direction is down. The, the problem, however, is not so much the number of weapons, but what they're doing with the weapons. The world has also become increasingly interdependent, making the threat of global nuclear war less and less plausible. However, the risk of an individual nuclear attack has increased. Today the Cold War has disappeared, but thousands of those weapons have not. In a strange turn of history, the threat of global nuclear war has gone down, but the risk of a nuclear attack has gone up. More nations have acquired these weapons. Testing has continued. Black market trade in nuclear secrets and nuclear materials abound. Uh, but now the problem is still not so much states, because states in general can be but it's uh, nuclear weapons that get loose, loose nukes. Now, from the last few years, especially the last decade since the war with terrorism became the reality for Americans after the we're facing a different kind of threat, and that is the threat of nuclear terrorism. Technological know-how behind nuclear weapons has become widely disseminated and accessible. A non-state terror organization like Al-Qaeda, uh, given the fact that it's become easier and easier to understand how to make a nuclear device, to either make one, steal one, buy one on the black market, or in any way acquire one. If they had sufficient amount of plutonium or highly enriched uranium, they could, they could certainly make a nuclear explosive device that would work. They could also, if they got a hold of radioactive poisons, make what are called dirty bombs, or radioactive or radiological weapons. And these are, are not mushroom cloud type nuclear explosions, but rather they are uh, devices that basically spread poisons around, uh, cesium, strontium, the things that are, that are, once you breathe or they get into your system can cause uh, enormous uh, uh, health and environmental hazards. It's the uh, method of choice in a suicide bomb. So uh, that's why uh, nuclear explosions in cities have gotten to be a lot more probable. You know, we weren't used to the concept that people were willing to commit suicide in order to uh, prove some point or go to heaven or whatever it is. Um, and so it's pessimistic in that point of view. When you take into account that humans are willing to kill themselves, a lot of safeguards become 
not useless, but they, they're of limited use. The United States could face, and still could face, the prospect of nuclear detonation in Washington, D.C., New York, or somewhere else. So the whole nature of the nuclear threat has changed in this age of terrorism. In fact, terrorists have attempted a number of nuclear attacks in the past decade. May 8, 2002. U.S. citizen Jose Padilla is arrested for allegedly planning a radiological attack on Chicago. Unfortunately, there's a lot more that we could be doing. And uh, there isn't any major target city in the United States that has done enough to really help itself in the event of a disaster like a nuclear detonation. November 2006. MI5 picks up chatter from Al Qaeda operatives planning on using nuclear weapons against cities in the UK. June 2007. The FBI releases the name of Adnan Dolcher Al Sukri Juma, the operations leader in a terrorist plot to attack targets in the US and UK. One nuclear weapon in one city, be it New York or Moscow, Islamabad or Mumbai, Tokyo or Tel Aviv, Paris or Prague, could kill hundreds of thousands of people. And no matter where it happens, there is no end to what the consequences might be. America's stated enemies today are often without a government, without a territory, enemies like Al-Qaeda that are not as tangible as the USSR. The problem of nuclear terrorism is, is, is very, very tricky because it has many faces to it. From the sort of uncontrollable parts of the society, society being the whole world, is a more serious threat. At least it's more scary because you have no idea what people would or what would not do. What is it? We, we cannot afford to wait for a nuclear explosion to go off before we re recognize the need to face up to the risks associated. Today, 2011, states such as Iran and North Korea continue to evade verification by the IAEA. So when the Security Council decides that you shall cease uranium enrichment, you shall suspend it, and you fail to do so, and there's nothing that happens as a result of this, it ends up calling into question the authority of the Security Council, if not the whole chart and the UN system as a whole. The threat of accidental detonation of a nuclear weapon is uncomfortably high, and the goal of complete disarmament seems unlikely while so much mistrust exists between states. But many of the developing countries and countries that don't have nuclear weapons say, now wait a minute, you're asking us to tighten up our controls on our facilities and we don't have nuclear weapons and you're not living up to your obligation to get rid of them? But obviously, uh, the non-nuclear weapon states from the very beginning thought it was unfair and argued so. Uh, and there are different restrictions, much more onerous restrictions on the non-nuclear weapon states which were unnecessary. Only further cooperation and transparency can strengthen an ailing non-proliferation regime that has struggled since the NPT. We're very, very stuck. These are tremendous dilemmas that we're facing. And not only we face them now, we're going to be facing them over the long haul. In today's complex political arena, cooperation is not always easy.
So the question is, why are we having these difficulties in a post-Cold War era where rapprochement and peaceful relations exist among the great powers? And the, the answer is, is, that, is that there are still major different differences in the national policies of states all around the world. Um, and a lot of it, I think, stems from the double standard that exists, which allows some states to retain nuclear weapons and other states that are told that you can't have nuclear weapons. Indeed, the last UN treaty produced regarding nuclear disarmament was over 10 years ago. The UN Disarmament Commission has not been able to reach agreement or consensus since 1999. And the rest of the time they've just been, been tangling with each other. They have no agreement at all on priorities. Policy maneuvers such as George Bush's Axis of Evil speech, in which he claimed that Iraq, Iran, and North Korea were arming to threaten the peace of the world only further alienate countries that already feel belittled and marginalized by the West. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world by seeking weapons of mass destruction. These regimes pose a grave and growing danger. Try to keep up with these rapid turning, rapidly turning events in the Middle East and in Northern Africa is impossible. Any move that the U.S. makes is fraught with danger. But there is hope. States such as Libya and Syria have dismantled their illicit nuclear weapons program after pressure from NPT members. And despite failures such as North Korea's withdrawal in 2003, the NPT remains the largest arms control treaty in the world. The START-1 Treaty of 1991 negotiated the reduction of US and Russian stockpiles by 80%, and the new START Treaty of 2011 signed by Barack Obama and Dmitry Medvedev is expected to reduce that number by another 50%. However, in today's multi-party system, bilateral negotiations such as the START Treaty are not enough. Policymakers must think on a multilateral, all-inclusive level. They must take into account not only the interests of rogue states and non-state actors, but also the new psychology of the public. Kofi Annan, our former Secretary General, once referred to civil society as the new superpower because of the potential influence it has over, over politics worldwide. Even, even the person who has no background whatsoever, the average citizen, can ask really good questions. They have a personal stake in, in the future here of this. And, and you, everyone has got their own unique skills to bring to them. Uh, poets, um, painters, artists, musicians, uh, it isn't just the nuclear physicists and, and peace markers that, that, are, that have a role to play. The most important thing we can do now is try to make rational decisions uh, that allow us to be better prepared because bad things are going to happen. There's no question about that. The question is, how easily are we going to snap back and continue doing what we need to do? It's a difficult, frustrating business, but I'm, I'm, I would not be in this business if, if I thought there was no hope for it at all.
will enable us to be able to manufacture ethanol from wood chips or switchgrass. Somebody said, what is switchgrass? I said, well, it's grass that looks like a switch that grows in dry country. 